Hey everybody, I'm Dan McDonald. I'm an artist and designer here in Chicago. I'm currently working on an illustrated album cover for Chicago band The Family Gold, who's going to be releasing a single very soon. And they approached me about designing the artwork for that release. Um, the concept that was decided on was to illustrate a really packed night at a honky-tonk bar. Um, and we wanted to give it sort of a Where's Waldo effect, where there's kind of little scenes and groups of activities happening within the larger image. So it's going to be a pretty dense illustration. It's going to be quite tedious for me, but uh, the cool thing is that I get to finally do a deep dive into a, a style of illustration I've always wanted to investigate, which is late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, it's got a very specific style of hatching and uh, um, line work. It's a very, very specific treatment. I've always, you can spot it pretty easily when you've looked at a lot of illustrations over the you know, course of art history. Um, it's a period where there's like a, the, the, the tightness and rigor of previous generations is sort of maturing into a shorthand. Um, things start to get a little more fluid. There's a lot more air to the whole thing, which is uh, very distinct. So um, I thought I'd make a video and bring you along with me into the studio to kind of see my process in deconstructing a historical style and trying to apply it to one of my own drawings. The first thing I would do with a project like this where I'm trying to evoke a period style is I would go through all the books I've got at the studio and kind of comb through Google Images and just try and pull out as many good examples of these techniques um, as I can. This is a pretty good spread and I've learned over the years that when you're trying to observe uh, a period style and sort of absorb it, it's really, really nice when you can get a bunch of examples lined up, you know, shoulder to shoulder, and uh, just sort of scan the whole group for, you know, common characteristics. And you can start to get at least a, a broad impression of the, I guess you'd say, the fashions of the time. So if I'm looking at these, I guess I could just sort of th think out loud here. Um, there are definitely some distinct features that are carrying throughout all of them. Um, why don't we just dive right in here? I mean, for a long time, I thought this style was very defined by just strictly the hatching technique. But now that I'm looking closely at them, it's way more than that. I mean, the hatching is a, is a super cool trick for the illusion of, of um, tone. But there's a lot more happening to make it look sp particular to this time period I'm chasing. And one of the big things is the organization of space. So this example is pretty good because what you can what I what I can clearly see, which is happening in all of them, is that the artist is really punching up the foreground figures with higher contrast that's really bright whites and really deep shadows to pull them forward and I'm seeing that the midground can sort of be a lot dimmer it it does seem to have a couple different shades but it's it seems to just be kind of a 50 percent gray up to white it wouldn't be anything darker than that all the darkest darks are saved for the foreground, I can see, and that's really what brings them in front of everything else. So that's one trick I'll have to remember. Um, and then, the, so the midground, we'll say, you know, gets maybe half of that. And then as, as you go to the background, these figures are basically just getting outlines, um, which is interesting. It seems they're still, you can still 
give a human face some features, even if it's just a couple of kind of specks floating in there. I mean, there's no real uh, accuracy to it, but I guess it's it was important to the artist to really make the human face recognizable as a form, even from a long ways away. And then the backgrounds, there's, there. I mean, these, these artists were definitely not afraid of empty space and the suggestion of more information. That's what's so cool about this kind of spatial system that they've, you know, matured into by this point in, in history is that the the previous generations there was probably more of a uh of a standard to co- cover the entire picture plane with some tone it's almost like i i have a feeling that if this image had been shown you know a hundred years earlier it would have been fucking grotesque to everybody as this unfinished sloppy you know just kind of uh doodle but here it's a very sophisticated and matured abbreviation of information it's really really cool um let's see what else yeah so i'm seeing that throughout uh where the foreground figures are getting the the widest um spectrum of tone from bright whites all the way to the dark darks that does not get applied anywhere else in their uh, environments. This is this hatching maybe is a little sloppier than I'll go. I, I actually really like the the really organized look of this one, for example. So there is some cross hatching happening, but it's a lot more. It seems to be uh, a clarity in line weight and you know sort of a withholding of cross hatching in the in the spirit of cleanliness maybe i don't know um i like this look though it's almost got sort of a actually it sort of you know looks it's almost in the family of engraving when you get to like this arm for example um the cross hatching is a would be a shading technique that this um clearly is showing isn't absolutely necessary i mean we're getting some real dark darks and some really full tone here just from a single hatch which is pretty cool these pants are fantastic they're not even toned at all i mean this this artist whoever it was i mean they just went ahead and did the pattern of the pants and it looks like it got shaded a little here only where it was absolutely necessary but we still can see the form of the legs and we get such a sense of there being a lot of information there that actually isn't there it's that's so cool this is a great example of what happens from foreground to midground to background so i'd like to keep that in mind these squigglies show up i've been seeing those here's one right there too I'm not likely to do that. Again, I think what I'll do is try and keep a an orderly cleanliness to everything like you see um, with that hatch. But you never know. Maybe I'll get a squiggle in there. Oh, my God. There's like one huge squiggle there. So I'll have to decide what the best way is to dim the background. I mean, it's one thing to not – to just leave it empty, but which would be like this back wall here. But there is some mid-ground – in a lot of these and that would be kind of this under the tunnel area so that appears to just get some tone it looks like maybe a single hatch done very briefly and quickly um this broken line is interesting maybe i could get some of that going to help kind of fade the tone a little very interesting oh here's some really nice clean hatch work i love how this pant leg is looking it's so organized and systematic you can see it again here so i think that is what i'll try and emulate now this figure here the whole all the skin tone has been cast in some tone which is 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 a really descriptive way of showing the darker skin tone so white figures is it you wouldn't fill any of the skin tone unless it was a deep shadow or I'm guessing if there was, uh, 
yeah, like mustaches and stuff like that. I mean, a face like this and this, I'm only seeing tonal hatching when it's absolutely necessary. But a figure with darker skin tone, like a black man, he would have from all, any exposed skin would be cast in some kind of tone. But this still follows all the same rules. It looks like our foreground figures here are getting the full treatment of of uh, tone from bright white to dark shadows. And then, of course, the background is not getting nearly as much. But I do like the hatching, how it's happening on these pants. So check this out. This is interesting. Check out these shadows happening under the feet that are kind of cast... I wonder if that happens on all of them. There it is there. I guess, yeah, that, he has one too. Oh yeah, Abe Lincoln's got... So that is, that is uh, wow, that's a very consistent feature. I'll have to remember that. So whoever's in the foreground should be getting a dark and long shadow across the floor. So it's really kind of giving it a... It's almost like putting your foreground figures under a bright spotlight. Almost like they're they're they almost it makes them look almost like they're staged in a play, like they're at the front of the stage where the spotlight is, and then everybody else is out of the light and sort of in the dimness of of space behind it. So that's a very interesting little tidbit. This is super cool here. This so this foreground figure even though he's clearly established um, by his placement and his uh, tonal contrast to be an important figure, and yet, actually all three of them are, and yet it goes, it has this real top to bottom effect going where it's mostly contrasty at the top, and then as you go down, it's almost like their legs are blending into the mid ground which this guy picks up, and then the midground flows into the background, which gets very little information. That's interesting. I may or may not use that. We'll have to see how that goes. That seems like a nice kind of softened um, transition to, uh, effect. I, I mean, I'll have to see if it ends up playing a part in my illustration. This is such a perfect um, example of the spatial organization, though just how much information you have on your important people and how much that gets reduced in your mid-ground elements all the way to getting to the background, which has barely anything. It's, it's so much empty space. These artists must have been... They just were not afraid to, you know, leave space empty, which, you know, in the big scheme of things is the you know a lean toward abstraction i mean there's no there's nothing there the information is sort of implied but it's it's an actual vacuum of information and yet it still feels it's it's really kind of telling us how much our brains um are involuntarily filling in information we don't even need it so this one for example i mean to me, it's clear that they're outside, and that's because of just the grass in the midground. There's literally nothing behind them, so it sort of feels like, oh, that just must be outdoor sky and just kind of general atmosphere. Very cool. What else is happening in these things? Oh, here's an interesting... Uh, and there's a, it shows up several times. So one thing that really seems to make this look happen is everything gets kind of... Is, and maybe this is part of the spatial organization, but everything gets this kind of halo around it. There's sort of an empty glow where foreground figures do not actually come in contact with their their uh, background elements, even shading. So there's this shading just stops short. It gives a maybe it's to kind of give a punchy contour to everything and bring it forward. I don't know. Here's a perfect example there. It's just kind of an empty space. So I guess that begs the question, are they shading around are they if they're shading around their foreground figures, does that mean they completely render the foreground elements first and then tone the background? I guess you would. I mean, how else would you know not to 
or how else would you know you know where to stop oh this is super this is a really good example of that halo that happens so this child appears to have a complete vacuum of space around its contour and even with a woman directly behind it none of that information is touching the contour i guess that maybe it is to just help bring it forward it certainly works this fellow here he has got that kind of empty space halo so i'll definitely have to use that trick here's some nice clean hatching here this is beautiful so we've got some really nice parallel hatching across the short axis and then a nice clear diagonal going uh, uh, crossing it. Here's them, some of those squiggly lines. I still don't know about those. I, I, I think, yeah, I probably won't end up using those. This is a very dense hatch. I don't think I would want anything that that dense, but this is a cool um, view of the different spacing of the hatches that I'll have to pay attention to because you can see these diagonals are really really spaced out and that gives a very clear order to things and it makes it really neat but then underneath it or maybe on top of it is a much tighter um, uh, hatch so maybe I'll have to consider the play between the the intersecting hatches maybe one should be a little tighter than the other to help separate them from each other or maybe it looks less cluttered to have one act as sort of an undertone and then a more spaced one a spaced out one on top acting as a an overtone that might be one of those really sophisticated things that uh it I'm sure to these artists it's just instinct. I mean, I don't know what they would have learned in their academies or in their apprenticeships. I don't know if anyone sat them down and told them that's how you do this, but it's very cool and it seems weirdly consistent. So I'm just looking for any other last minute tricks that I can keep in my bag and maybe apply to my own drawing really beautiful drawings though they're just so um, there's so much speed you can really <clears throat> there's there's so much kind of forensic evidence in just looking at them you can you can almost uh, tell where a line has started and where the artist lifted it right off of the page again now this is some extremely tight um, hatching here. I probably am not going to get that tight. It almost looks like a, a tone, a wash, like an ink wash or something. Um, and that's, I guess, you know, applause to the artist that can that was that consistent. I mean, that looks beautiful. It's like this beautiful slate gray tone. I also notice how that is diagonal. It looks like all of the background tone is pretty diagonal maybe there's some uh, variation there I don't know this is all vertical back here that looks nice so there there is a part of that space and um, abbreviation of background information maybe that's lending itself I don't know if this is an agent of that or if this was intentional in in concert with that but all of these drawings from this period do seem to employ this kind of soft faded vignette this like fade to white on the edges and I guess if you look back and think about you know even photographs of Civil War era portraits or Abraham Lincoln or whatever even the photographs they tend they, they do seem to sort of fade on the edges so this uh, and this one's perfect example. So all the light seems to come in from the outside, and the tone really only hangs on what the artist is declaring as the most important subject matter. So very interesting. I th I suppose in my drawing I'll have to basically fade to white on the edges, or you know, kind of not be afraid to let the light fill in all four corners and gradually get, um, you know, kind of shaded over. But there is such a clear spotlight on all of these. There, there's such a punchy contrast 
to everything in the front of the stage that I really, really think is um, crucial to this look. So that's that's just some brief um, impressions of it. I'm sure I'll keep referring back to this this um, collection of examples as I'm doing the drawing, but that gives me a couple of of nice kind of pillars at least to uh, to keep in mind. So why don't we give this drawing a try and we'll see if we can't get close to this style. <laughs> 